This video is about the academic field of study called neurolinguistics. So if you're looking for information about neurolinguistic programming, this is not the video for you, because despite the name, neurolinguistic programming has actually nothing to do with the field of neurolinguistics, nor with any branch of linguistics. Hello and welcome to Linguistics and the Like. If this is your first time here, my name is Juliana, and in this channel I try to talk about different topics within linguistics. And today let's have a basic overview of neurolinguistics. Then let me know in the comments uh, if you'd like me to maybe make a more in-depth video about one or some of the topics that I will mention in this video. Timestamps and references are in the description box below as always. Neurolinguistics is the study of how language is processed and represented in the brain. It is considered both a branch of linguistics and a branch of neuroscience. It tries to understand how language knowledge and language use are grounded in the brain. So the question is, what are the neural substrates of language? It also studies language-related pathologies such as dyslexia and aphasia. Neurolinguistics provides means to test the different hypotheses of linguistic theories, such as generative or cognitive models of grammar. Many methods used in neurolinguistics are also used in first and second language acquisition research. Developments in neurolinguistics may lead to the development of other more refined linguistic theories in the future and may also lead to the development of more appropriate treatment for those language-related pathologies. So these are some of the goals of neurolinguistics. Before we begin, let's have a quick look at very basic human brain anatomy, because I will be mentioning some of these terms throughout the video. The largest part of the brain is the cerebrum, and the outer layer of the cerebrum is the cortex, which is the gray matter with all of those folds, the thing that we think about when we think about the brain. Below it, we have the cerebellum and the brainstem. The cortex is divided into four lobes and two hemispheres, left and right. And each hemisphere controls the opposite part of the body. For example, your left hemisphere controls your right hand. And the cerebrum also contains subcortical structures. Neurolinguistics started with studies on aphasia back in the 19th century. Broadly speaking, aphasia is when someone has difficulties either with uh, producing or with comprehending language due to some brain damage caused by an accident or a stroke or a tumor. The term neurolinguistics didn't exist back then in the 19th century. Uh, it was called aphasiology and it was part of neurology. The term neurolinguistics only appeared in the 1960s and 70s mainly. But we can consider that the field of neurolinguistics started about 100 years earlier, in around 1860, with the work of Paul Broca, who was a French neurologist. At that time, the only way to study the brain was through autopsy studies. So when a patient was admitted into a hospital displaying a neurological disorder, neurologists would make careful observations, and then once the patient had died, they would examine the brain to check which areas were damaged, so they could develop theories about uh, the role that the different parts of the brain uh, play in normal brain functioning. So Broca observed a patient who was almost unable to speak, but who seemed to understand everything that was said to him. Right after the patient died, he examined the brain and found a lesion in the lower rear area of the frontal lobe, and he concluded that that area must be responsible for language production because that was the problem with the patient, he couldn't speak. Later, other autopsies confirmed Broca's hypothesis, and now that area is called Broca's area, and the speech impairment that is caused by a lesion in that area is called Broca's aphasia. The discovery of Wernicke's area was also key to the development of neurolinguistics. It was discovered in a similar fashion by German physiologist Karl Wernicke. But Wernicke's aphasia is practically the opposite of Broca's aphasia, affecting comprehension rather than production. Therefore, Wernicke's area was assumed to be the center for language comprehension. From these early studies emerged a view that the different language functions are located in specific areas of the left hemisphere of the cortex. 
The basic idea was that there are specific centers in the brain responsible for particular language functions and that there are also connecting pathways between them, which are also responsible for some language functions. So a lesion in either of those areas or in the connecting pathways would give rise to the different types of aphasia. And there are more types of aphasia than the ones that I mentioned earlier. However, there are some problems with this model because there are types of aphasia that don't fit the model. And also, later it was discovered that there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between the location of a patient's lesion and the type of aphasia that they have. There are people, for example, who have a lesion in Broca's area but don't have Broca's aphasia or vice versa. In this first phase of research, uh, they weren't using linguistic theories yet. Uh, they were not trying to, to understand aphasia uh, in linguistic terms. For instance, a patient with Wernicke's aphasia uh, has trouble with language comprehension because they have an impairment in the processing of speech sounds or is it an impairment in the processing of uh, the meaning of the words? So they were not asking these questions yet. It was, uh, it was all based on clinical observation and they were basically describing aphasia. Throughout the 20th century, that model was revised and expanded and by the end of the 1970s, it was already known that there were language problems that were caused by lesions on the right hemisphere of the cortex as well. But those were different kinds of disorders. They were considered pragmatic disorders. So it was assumed that the left hemisphere was responsible for standard linguistic processing, whereas the right hemisphere would be responsible for paralinguistic uh, communicative abilities. In the mid 20th century, um, Researchers in neurolinguistics started uh, using linguistic theories and using experimental methods taken from psycholinguistics and from cognitive psychology. So that was the actual birth of the field of neurolinguistics. And then, and most importantly, uh, during the 1980s and mainly the 1990s, they started using new technology in neurolinguistics research. And that is the key feature of neurolinguistics. Those are neuroimaging techniques, such as fMRI and PET scans, which allow researchers to identify which areas of the brain are activated when subjects perform a particular linguistic task, because those areas are highlighted. Electrophysiological measures are also used in neurolinguistics, for example, electroencephalograms and event-related brain potentials, which capture cognitive processes as they unfold over time. And increasingly, these methods are being mixed to help researchers get clearer and more accurate results. Data gathered using these new methods showed that the classical model was correct in assuming that Broca's area and Wernicke's area and their vicinities are central for language, but it was also shown that the functions uh, traditionally assigned to, to those areas may not be entirely correct. Now we know that we cannot really separate uh, comprehension and production. We can't associate production only with Broca's area and comprehension only with Wernicke's area. A number of studies show the involvement of other areas as well, both in comprehension and in production. It seems that actually the whole brain, or almost, is involved in language processing. Uh, not only areas in the cortex, but also subcortical areas and the cerebellum as well. Neuroscience as a whole is beyond the one-to-one -one mapping of cognitive functions into brain areas. The different parts of the brain work together as networks. If we hear that language is based on a network or uh, a brain system, we may still think that uh, this would involve the different components of grammar being processed separately, uh, because that's what used to be thought. Uh, it used to be thought that the organization of language in the brain was modular, that is, that the different uh, levels of linguistic representation or the different components of grammar, uh, namely syntax, phonology, semantics, etc., uh, that they all, uh, that each of them had their own uh, processing center in the brain. But fMRI studies have shown that the processing of 
each component of grammar uh, also activates a broadly distributed network. And the activation of one component of grammar influences the activation of the others as well. Okay, so now we know that language uses a network in the brain. But what isn't clear is why and how, if there are many areas which are activated and there is information flow, flow among them, uh, what exactly are the functional roles of each area? So this is something that isn't clear yet. Uh, there are many hypotheses, but uh, a final conclusion has not been drawn yet. To remember that I said that it was assumed that the left hemisphere was responsible for uh, standard linguistic processing and the right hemisphere for communicative abilities. Apparently, not exactly. The right hemisphere participates in processing all levels of linguistic structure. And many studies have shown activations in the left hemisphere for pragmatic tasks as well. So, right-left hemisphere differences are not clear yet. We should be cautious about making sweeping generalizations about left brain versus right brain abilities or strategies. In all probability, complex mental activities involve the coordinated functioning of both hemispheres. The representation of language in the brain provides a useful example of this. There is evidence to suggest that language processing also relies on extralinguistic systems. And also, the same regions implicated in language processing are also involved in other cognitive functions, such as decision-making, uh, face processing, audiovisual integration, and other things. So there is this overlap of functions in different areas, which is something that is not well explained yet. As for confirming or not the different linguistic theories, such as generative grammar or cognitive linguistic theories, that's still a work in progress as well. Another thing we know now is that the representation of language in the brain actually varies considerably among individuals. It is influenced especially by age and by handedness, so if you are right-handed or left-handed. Most right-handed individuals uh, have language mainly represented in the left hemisphere, so they are said to be lateralized for language. But left-handed individuals are not so lateralized. Many of them uh, also have uh, the representation of language mainly on the left hemisphere, but many on the right, and many also have bilateral representation. Things like your level of literacy and how many languages you speak uh, also make a difference. The use of more than one language has been shown to uh, alter the language network in the brain. I hope this video helped you have an idea of what neurolinguistics is, so let me know in the comments which topics you would like to know more about. And if you happen to already have a, a considerable knowledge of neurolinguistics and happen to watch this video, please share your knowledge with everyone in the comment section. And if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others. It helps my channel a lot. And consider subscribing to the channel if you like this type of content. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.